So we're going to start with um, your introduction. So you want to go for slides, yeah? Yes. Yeah, okay. So we're going to start with a few slides to wake you up. And then uh, after, we're going to start, you know, discussing. So you can come here, and uh, we're going to watch your side. All right. Good afternoon. Um, hi, my name is Nancy Kirshner Rodriguez. I am with the Business Network for Offshore Wind. Um, I know we have a bunch of members in here, and I also hope if you are not familiar with us, you will become familiar with the Business Network. We are an about... Um, decade-old uh, organization originally started in Maryland, and we have over 550 um, member companies. We're thrilled to partner with um, TMA Blue Tech and to be here. And I've been working with the network for like four years in California, um, and it was kind of lonely back then, but now it's um, picking up quite a lot. So just really quickly, we are focused on building a domestic supply chain. So obviously that means both um, the industry and the workers with it. And we're a nonprofit. And we have, um, I want to point this out for anyone that is just really trying to learn super basics about offshore wind. We created like a, a very basic whyoffshorewind.org site. That's like for the general public. Um, and then just, I think you've heard a lot, um, but just to give us a little context, I think some of our, our big mapping um, items here are pretty helpful because you'll see there's like the huge goals. It's pretty intimidating, but there's already a lot being invested in our country. And then you heard earlier today, I don't, I don't want to, like repeat, but we see sort of all these different pieces of the puzzle starting to come together. And the network, we really, we really keep talking about a national industrialization strategy. And we're trying to push the different pieces sort of into four components, you'll see. And I'm happy to answer, you know, a lot more questions when we have a dialogue. Um, but then what, what does this really mean? 30 gigawatts, it means 2,100 turbines. It means 6,300 blades. It means 7,100 miles of cable vessels, which, and it means a lot of workers, of course. So these, so I'm proud to say that in June, the federal government joined with, uh, the White House joined with the president and, um, and 11 governors, I think, and created this new partnership. Um, California, it's the East Coast states right now, um, but we, um, our CEO presented, and we were trying to take a look at, like, we're doing a lot of looking at the details uh, of what, what the different components are, how many, we are tracking all since Jan we are tracking all the contracts that are happening. We are looking. Um, we I urge you. We're going to be having an event here December fourteenth called um, California Supplier Day here in San Francisco. I have things. Sorry, in San Diego, I have um, little information postcards. But we have a free um, entity called Supply Chain Connect that you can just put yourself into and start getting known, I, I would say a lot of the developers and the tier one and tier two suppliers are looking at it and looking for different um, companies to be part of things. Um, this is just a lot more data that we could go through if people have questions, Because, um, but you'll see up in the upper top there that we're talking about what does exist. Like I said, mostly on the East Coast right now. So but there are community colleges developing programs. There's a lot of initiatives that the developers that are um, in charge of East Coast projects are supporting. And then I mentioned this, the, um, the federal state partnership. And then these are just some of obviously like 
the U.S. market. I, I feel like it keeps coming up. I've heard Pierre ask a couple of questions, but these are components that our industry in the U.S. must figure. We have to figure all of this out and make it work in order to make our workforce and industry work. So, but it's a lot of money coming into this project, these projects so far. And of course, we'll be having the California auction on December 6th, the first one. So you all, I think, know general information about how our structure works. We can go back to that. These are all, I think these are all the big developers that have projects right now. And I just wanted to show this to you just because this shows you, if you haven't looked at it, and you can have access to all of this afterwards, but where all of our different, where the projects are and where they're coming to, um, and looks at them in different ways, all the different data. Um, we are really promoting regional cooperation um, for supply chain and for workforce. And I'm showing this, but we want it for the West Coast too. And like last year, our organization, we worked with the Western Governors Association to get offshore wind and regional cooperation into their energy um, resolution. So now you've heard this will, is what happened. Gonna happen. There are 43 eligible bidders though. So for any of you here, it would be good to take a look at all of those Bidders, obviously, know as much as you can about them beforehand. And I think Nessie talked about the bidding credits and the different things that are going to happen. We can talk more about that. So um, I just want to mention this. This is the so floating. I can't tell if flow in is here. The DOE has a project, um, right? has an incentives project right now that I would also love to have, maybe I can work with Matt afterwards to make sure that you all um, have that information. This is just showing you how we're tracking everything. And I could go on forever, so I feel like a lot of it will probably have to be in um, the Q&A. But I would mention here um, all these pieces here. California needs to have a, a workforce, and we have all of these, and we think all of these workforces are um, can be obviously diversified into offshore wind. Um, so, and then this is just good ways. These are the ways that we look at everything, so that we are trying to then look at the developer, the tier ones, and then tier two and three. And the reason for that is then we break it down into many, many, many components. And we believe there should be workforce development training and um, opportunities in all of these areas. This is our supply chain database. It just shows where you see where things are right now. Um, oh, and that was just the components. And then this just gives you an idea of how things have broken out so far. And I will not go into all the East Coast ports issues, but I will tell you that picture on top is the Humboldt Bay um, plan. But obviously, we can talk a lot more about that. There's a lot of work that's going to have to be done uh, workforce and work that's going to have to be done to develop our ports um, to work correctly. And then I will just mention, this is just us. This is all the type of workforce training that we are doing. We have Foundation to Blade, which is our extensive, and I would love to work at some point with maybe with Blue Tech to do that here. Um, every Friday we have a one-hour overview online for if you want to educate yourself more about offshore wind. So um, like I said, we have data. This is our event that's coming up. This will be our ginormous conference, which started sort of in a telephone booth, and now we'll have probably 5,000 people. And 
I'm not giving you all the solutions, but um, I ran through that quickly, and then I hope that um, we can have a conversation once my, we will. Brilliant, my brilliant colleagues. We will. Uh, my first question, uh, before we, we get into the uh, other introductions, <clears throat> do you have any idea of what will be the cascade jobs created for one industrial job? Meaning, you know, in the offshore wind, if we have one industrial job, how many job, service job, uh, related to this industrial job could be created? Do you have any idea? So like one wind farm? Or one yeah, wind farm. One wind farm. I mean, I think they've been estimating several thousand. However, the way job es jobs are estimated, sometimes it's the hours connected to the jobs, not the actual... So, Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sometimes it's the hours connected to the jobs, not actually like individual jobs. Um, and then if we push it out, but we do believe several thousand. Okay, perfect. So Dan, uh, you're a senior advisor for environment. You We're going to have Eddie go. Come again? Oh, are you asking questions, or you want me to go? Next? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I wanted you to go ahead, and, and I don't know if you have slides. You have slides? No. Okay. So maybe you can introduce yourself and tell us what you're doing, and uh, tell us why you're on the stage, and uh, what are your expectations being on the stage. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, my name is Dan Jacobson. I'm the senior advisor to Environment California, um, and I've been working here in California on clean energy issues for the past 24 years. Um, approximately, and you're probably pretty familiar with some of the work um, that we've done. Um, in 2000 and, uh, 2001 and 2002, we introduced and helped to pass the first renewable portfolio standard, which set that goal of saying that California will generate 20% of its electricity from clean energy by uh, 2017. Um, we then were instrumental in passing all of the other RPS bills, including the last one that a lot of people refer to, SB 100, which put us on a path to getting 100% of our energy from clean energy sources. We also worked with Governor Schwarzenegger to do the Million Solar Roofs um, Initiative, which I'm happy to say installed a million solar roofs. Um, and we're now at about 1.4 million roofs here in California. Um, there's one initiative that we did that half of you in the room will probably hate, which is the one that bans the use of single-use plastic bags from grocery stores. So if you don't like that one, you can blame me. But the one that probably everyone in the room does like is we worked with Eddie and others to pass, um, author and pass um, AB 525, which is the um, offshore wind bill that eventually um, the California Energy Commission um, in their proceedings adopted a goal of organizing 25 gigawatts off the coast of California. So we're really happy and proud of the work that we've been able to do together. The one thing that we've been asked to look at today is sort of, okay, 25 gigs is a lot of energy. Um, it, it would help California tremendously in climate, clean energy, but how do we build it? What do we do for the workforce? Are the workers ready? <clears throat> And I was looking at this for the past couple of months and, and sort of going through my notes, but luckily NREL came out with a study that basically looked at this whole issue of the workforce for offshore wind. And you can read their study, which is called U.S. Offshore Wind Workforce Assessment, which came out in October of 2022. And what I want to do is sort of go through their national assessment and then take out eight points that they had both on education and on workforce development and just add in then what I think is the California translation to that. So what do we have to do here in California right now that would translate into having a workforce that would be ready to go here in California as we ramp up on offshore winds? So that's what I'm doing here. Um, but why don't I just keep going, Eddie, and then we'll go to your part too. So the first part, if you look at this, is that um, the workforce development coordination needs to continue and to expand. And the one thing I would encourage people who are doing, if you're an offshore wind or anything that has to do with offshore, is there's the California Workforce Development Board, and they're one of the underutilized um, real great resources that we have here in the state. They've got access to money, they've got access to working with the labor unions, they've got access to working with the schools and the community colleges. You've gotta be able to go to them, set up the programs that you want. 
The second is aligning and standardizing safety training for offshore wind energy workers. That's one of the highest priorities that we have, and there's currently no official industry training standard. So th this has got to be one of the places where California can set the gold standard for what it takes to install offshore floating wind off the coast, not just of California, but can the work that we do here on environmental protection, on labor standards, on environmental justice, end up being used all over the country, all over the world as sort of the gold standard for what we're gonna do. And again, I would insert the words blue economy anywhere where I'm saying offshore wind. Third is aligning training requirements and the times that are expected to, but, well basically as the industry ramps up, we don't have enough people right now who are even trained to train. I would argue that we've got to set up, and Eddie and I just came back from um, a tour over in Europe where we were able to see um, both some of the offshore wind, but see some of the places where this is manufactured. We've got to set up an exchange program where here in the US we can bring people over there to basically become the trainers of the trainers so that when they come back to the US, we can ramp this up and go even faster. Um, fourth in education is that there's many existing educational and training programs that could be adopted to expand offshore wind. And I would just say, yes, we've got to look at what already exists within the systems in California and figure out the things that we can just tweak within the educational model to be able to expand that include the blue economy and the sustainable blue economy projects that we want to be able to run. Let me quickly run through some of the four of the workforce initiatives that we have to have. First is that we have to focus on local workforce and offer the opportunity to simultaneously ensure that the communities who are impacted by this are also getting the benefits. We'll hear a little bit more from Eddie to talk about this, but this seems like a no-brainer, is that the communities that are gonna be impacted should be the ones that get the best benefits from this. Two is expanding the partnerships with the unions that can support and supply the training that's required for this. If, you, if there's any union folks here in this room, I would argue that this is true, and we've said this any number of times when we've done these workshops with them. We have some of the best trained and best qualified union folks here in the country, um, and we should be taking advantage of that in order to move the projects to be able to go faster. If we try to go around the labor unions here in California, I think you're gonna see an immediate slowdown of the projects, and it's, it's just not gonna really work. Three is we need to be supporting apprenticeship programs for individuals to gain the necessary skills and the trades here. This is just sort of a no-brainer, I would say. And the fourth one, I would say, is if there is any silver bullet to being able to move quickly on sustainable offshore resources, it's our ability to take the workers who are right now currently doing oil and gas infrastructure work and be able to retrain and move them over to any of the sustainable blue economy issues that we have. We have a lot of people who do that work. They're going to need to transition. We need to set up the programs that allow them to move from, whether it's, it's um, an electrician, whether it's a, a pipe fitter, or any of these other programs, so that they can move smoothly and quickly over into the programs that are gonna allow them to do the development for the offshore wind infrastructure or offshore blue economy infrastructure that we need them to do. There's a whole nother section about equity, but I wanna really turn that over to Eddie, who's been an expert in that, um, and say thank you, we'll take questions, but introduce Eddie on, the Executive Director of Brightline Defense. Thank you, Dan. Um, so Eddie, maybe you can introduce yourself, and then after we go for the questions. So you've heard a lot of uh, talking already. Uh, what I'll do is I'll try to keep my remarks brief for like two to three minutes, and then we'll just launch into questions from there on out. But uh, Eddie on again, Executive Director of Brightline Defense. We're a nonprofit based in San Francisco. And our value add, I guess, is a way to put it to the space is really around workforce development training. We do run a job training, set of job training programs in uh, the communities that we serve, which typically are underserved environmental justice communities. And then we also do policy work, particularly around offshore wind, uh, and have been working a lot with Dan Jacobson and Nancy as well in Sacramento policymaking circles, for instance, as this becomes proposed and positioned on particularly the North Coast and Central Coast of California. 
And for us, the way we think about it is that, you know, there's the practice itself of job training and then placing people on an actual work site. And then there's the high level equity policy that should guide each project that's being actually uh, submitted to, you know, the government approval processes that exist. And thinking through just one key concept is local hiring. That is uh, something that's critical to understand well uh, in California in particular, where there's a history essentially of economic development projects that happen without necessary uh, corresponding benefits for the surrounding community. So in other words, if you happen to live in the neighborhood, you see a big gleaming tower go up, whether it's an offshore wind turbine or a condo tower, it can be frustrating to the community uh, surrounding it to not partake in any of those economic or workforce development benefits. So thinking through that and as developers come and uh, infuse themselves throughout the community, the hope is it's ultimately a collaborative relationship. So when it comes to policy, sometimes there are percentages, for instance, of the work hours assigned to a project. That's what Nancy talked about earlier. That sometimes is measured by worker hours itself. Other times it can be measured in FTE, full-time employee jobs too. And just considering, of course, there are thousands of jobs in play, thinking through how to measure out the job training system to feed into the job placement system is a key part of that analysis. So if we're, for instance, talking about 10% of worker hours, uh, then it would be about trying to make sure that the job training system is built up with hopefully public sector funds, as well as the staff necessary to make that system uh, workable at the end of the day. The North Coast itself, um, you will probably learn if you're engaged on the ground, has a history already of economic development boom and bust cycles of timber, of gold. So they've seen things come and go. And so that's why even now, when you come to the region, it's a relatively remote area. There's not a lot of road infrastructure. The airport's very small. And there are things that are needed to sustain a much more robust economy around something like offshore wind. So even thinking through that is really important, as is the case also for Central Coast. The transmission infrastructure is there, but not necessarily a corresponding port development infrastructure that's needed, as well as other parts of um, offshore wind that are uh, needed to support such a sprawling economy. It's all, of course, measured against gigawatts, like how much generation there is in play. Uh, but I think we can discuss that perhaps more in the question and answer session accordingly. Thank you so much, Eddie. So let's start with the question. Uh, I have the feeling that uh, on, on the paper, everything has been written, everything is perfect, but what is the real situation? And um, if tomorrow you're going to start, you know, to accelerate and deploy the wind, uh, the offshore wind, would you be ready in terms of uh, recruiting the people, having the right competencies? And do we agree, you know, in the room, I'd like, you know, to, to hear more about, you know, scripts, about Shell, about, you know, Don, you know, participating to the commerce. How do we see, you know, the global picture? And would we be um, a dream situation or are we, uh, are we considering that it's achievable? Who would like you know, to take this one? So can you hear me? Um, I, th I think that there's no question it's going to be, I think for everyone, a, it's gonna be a steep hill. Um, but what's been really great, and I think you heard it earlier today from you know, a state and federal um, leaders talking about the efforts to try to work more, uh, more robustly together, but there's also going to need to be a lot of investment commitment. I mean, I believe that the workers w can be and would be available, but I believe it's gonna take a lot of investment and especially um, the all, everything connected just to the port infrastructure because without the port infrastructure, it's going to be hard for us to build out the workforce in the various parts of the supply chain because getting things to a port and then being able to bring everything out to the ocean um, is a big challenge. But I, the both the BOEM process and then I think state pieces of it, they're trying to put together I, I feel like they want to call them carrots, right? There's a lot of carrots coming for, uh, for the developers, but it's gonna take an all of government approach in California partnered with the private sector. And I mean, our first on, um, our goals are right to get, to get power online starting in 2030, which is not that far away but obviously then it's building out after that. 
So Dan, you should be working on a day-to-day -day basis with all the industry and the key player and the key stakeholders to prepare, you know, this this big, you know, rush on the workforce. How do you how do you collaborate with them and what is the plan? Um, well, let me say two things on that. The first is that um, while I'm encouraged to hear the state officials come up here and talk about the goals that have been set and all the work that they want to do, that's just sort of one step of what has to happen. And what I, I think probably the one missing place um, that, that we haven't seen or a void that needs to get filled is that the sustainable blue economy needs to have more of a political presence than it currently does. And there is not enough push in Sacramento. There might be at sort of the local places, but only when there's a project that has to be developed. But there is, there is a void. I mean, just compare yourself to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley has an incredibly powerful voice in Sacramento and in, and in Washington, D.C., but the blue economy would be a quiet whisper compared to that. And so I think the first thing that has to, and then you might say, well, why do we need to do that? And I would answer, you know, because there is resources to be gained from being able to do that kind of organizing. There's resources to be gained just in what we have been talking about in terms of workforce development. There's resources to be gained in um, the, you know, sort of the finances that can be used to put forward. Again, just to use offshore wind as a project or as an example, we're gonna need billions of dollars of transmission to be able to organize offshore wind so that we can basically plug, it'd be the same thing for if we wanna do offshore wave. I guess there's no onshore wave, but so there's only <laughs> offshore wave. But if we wanted to do, so if, if we wanna do either of those technologies, we've gotta be able to look at transmission and say, okay, well, how does, how does this plug in and where is this gonna to come to? But you're competing right now against a lot of other people who would say, well, maybe we wanna put it somewhere else. Maybe we don't need the transmission to go over there. You know, it's the same with workforce development. It's, it's the same with so much of the training and opportunities that we have. I think the one place that we need to do better organizing is actually up in Sacramento and create sort of a sustainable blue economy caucus of this group who can go up and influence many of our key decision makers. But Dan, uh, when I started Bimery in 2008, uh, it was actually in San Diego at Scripps with the former director, Tony Emmett, and the governor, Schwarzenegger. Uh, I participated to this board and we were seeing exactly the same thing, 2008. So we need to educate people and raise, you know, the, the awareness about the blue bioeconomy and the blue economy at large. Well, it has been quite a long time and we're exactly at the same situation now. So what can we do in a very practical way? Do we need, you know, to go on TV, advertise the potential? Do we need to explain people uh, what is the blue economy in a very simple word? You know, are facing, you know, this type of issue, talking to investors on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, each time I'm presenting a case, they don't understand. Say, blue what? Okay, yeah, the number is uh, too risky for me. They, they don't understand. So how can we take it to the next level? Maybe Eddie. I mean, offshore wind is one of those really complicated pieces of policy re that require federal, state, local government approvals. But I think the good news is when it comes to California, at least in the North Coast region, you'll find players already on the ground talking about it doing the education that you're uh, talking about is necessary. So maybe one group to look up would be, say, Core Hub, which is based with the Humboldt Area Foundation. It's essentially an organizing uh, network around community groups in the Humboldt region, talking already about offshore wind, acclimating people to this the potential of this technology. And of course, it's all dependent ultimately on what developers are able to deliver for their communities at the end of the day. So this notion of community benefits, community benefits agreements, those are all important parts of the conversation to get people comfortable even with uh, this new blue technology. Um, another thing, Mike. Another thing that um, I mentioned to one of the people I was sitting with before, there are, for those of you that are, um, have either products and or services, but are, are thinking, you know, a big about new ways to do things, et cetera. There are entities that are funding different things. There is this federal government um, initiative, the Flow In initiative, but there's also um, an entity called Now RDC, 
which um, funds different innovative projects. And I'll also get that information to, um, to Matt for our follow-up, but they have funded a lot of different um, interesting and very uh, provocative, I would say, um, ideas that I think developers are then taking and you know putting into their into their development plans. So, um, but I will continue to say that I agree with that idea about the blue economy. And I think I think California, we have seen examples. I mean, I am constantly talking about like the amount of money that California has invested in the electric vehicle infrastructure initiatives and to help and now the amount of money that is also going into green hydrogen i i think that the blue economy should be really pushing for its I, i'm going to pass the mic you know to to shell the, it's a global company <laughs> and they they have to work and anticipate you know the, the demand in terms of workforce and they need qualified workforce so Lydia, tell us in a few words what you think about this wow okay <laughs> So let me think. Um, no, I think everything you said actually really resonated with me and it makes me think, and maybe it's a bit of speaking to the next panel, but it makes me think about um, you know, the early days of deep water. So Shell was a pioneering in the deep water space. It was the same thing. There was no technology, no infrastructure, no workforce. And um, to some extent, it makes us maybe a bit more realistic about what it will take to, to build this new industry here in California. Uh, but it will require, as you were saying, a lot of investments, um, a lot of collaboration, and, and thinking about all these different pieces because they all have to come together for the development to be successful. So I, I guess one question I, I would have is, you know, where where to start? What is it that we're not doing um, right now that we should be doing more as a developer? Um, you know. Everything is going to accelerate, I think, after the December 6th, uh, once, uh, once uh, developers will have access to, to sites and, uh, and with, in, I mean, st sorry, through the leases, it will, I think, accelerate in any case. So, but yeah, interested to hear your thoughts about what we should be doing more. Well, I, I, I would argue, and this is to follow up on your question that you just asked, but um, there's, I think there's two kinds of education that has to happen. There's sort of the kind of education that Eddie was just referring to, like local governments and talking to local leaders and, and all that kind of stuff. Then there's just raw hearts and minds campaigns that you all know what I'm talking about because you all have the products in front of you that do it all the time. But um, we don't do enough of sort of talking about how great a particular product like any of the sustainable stuff that we're doing offshore would be. And we don't run hearts and minds campaigns that invest people into it and that make people think, wait, this is exactly what I wanna do. It would help with the education when you have high school kids thinking, okay, well, what do I wanna do? Well, I just saw a commercial about someone who climbs to the top of a huge offshore wind tower. I wanna do that. You don't, so until we invest in that kind of education and that kind of outreach and that kind of hearts and minds, we're always gonna be behind the game when we have to go to a mayor or a city council and we say, oh, we've got this great you know, offshore technology and people are just gonna look at us like we have three heads. So we have to get over that. The second thing is just, as Nancy was saying, is like, it isn't surprising that now you're seeing the EV infrastructure, EV and I would say including hydrogen, has got probably, I think it was close to $10 billion this last year from the state government. Now, that's because they organized and have been organized for the past 10 or 15 years in the legislature. They've got powerful advocates, they've got coalitions, they run campaigns, they work with legislators, they play that game. And to date, I would argue that the sustainable blue economy has been a little light on that and needs to ramp up their game. there. Dan, I think that we're going to put you on TV because you're the best ambassador, you know, for yeah. this kind of uh, a vision. <laughs> Uh, let me ask a question here to Ron because he's part of this, you know, he has, you know, the commercial vision and he wants, you know, to accelerate in the development. And uh, you mentioned yesterday that there was a gap between, uh, you know, the collaboration uh, between the industry, the government, you're very willing, you know, to do and to engage. But uh, how can you, uh, you know, fill the gap and how can you accelerate, you know, the collaboration with the private sector on this? Um, all right. So just uh, by way of introduction. I work for the U.S. Department of Commerce. 
the International Trade Administration. Our role is to promote exports abroad, but also to attract foreign direct investment here stateside. And so these offshore wind uh, projects are gonna be massive for the state of California. Now, that all being said, um, I work on a day-to-day -day basis with a wide variety of marine technology companies, and their number one complaint is workforce. We just don't have the people that we need uh, to get the job done. And so um, it's kind of frustrating for me because to what Pierre just mentioned, I was expressing some frustration early, in an earlier session about the lack of federal, state, county, municipal collaboration in this industry sector. And you hit on a real hot button for me, which is the voice, right, of the industry. And how do we get all hands on deck? How do we get that multi-leveled cooperation, collaboration to mobilize a, a, a workforce to meet the needs of the industry? Because right now, to your point, it's a whisper. Silicon Valley has tons of money. The marine tech sector are all mom and pop shops. A lot of them are all here, and they're, you know, in terms of that voice, that collective voice, that's definitely. Maybe Andy, you can comment on this. Um, I, I, one maybe way to get at that too, I've been thinking about is academic institutions and a way to centralize perhaps some of the collaborations within them. At least in Humboldt right now, they have a new designation, Cal Poly Humboldt. Uh, which I think is potentially very exciting, that can be essentially a housing vehicle. Uh, Cal Poly Slow, San Luis Obispo is another possibility for the Central Coast, but that's just one spitballing. Well, and just don't forget that the story you just told of like, most of these groups are mom and pop. I mean, with all due respect, some are also not mom and pop. So, well, you know, <laughs> and others, but like, you know, so, but that's one of the best yeah, California stories that we have. I mean, Silicon Valley was invented by people in their garage. You can't get more mom and pop than that, and we should tap into that story as much as we can. Mom and pop, the ocean, clean energy, protecting our oceans, that's as good a story as I think you can find for the coast of California. And if you can spread that, sort of spread that economic love around so that it's not just sort of on the coast, but that we're going into Stockton, into Bakersfield, into Fresno, into so many of the places that have been historically left behind when it comes to the clean energy economy. Although, you know, in Bakersfield, they have more solar than I think anyone else, any county in the country. But let's tap into that and, and use the best stories that we have. Anita, you from Mississippi and you work hard, you know, to try, you know, to bridge you know, the gaps and, and training you know, the young generation, the next generation. So how do you see that? And uh, how do you, do you work on a day-to-day -day basis you know, improving you know, the, the, you know, the possibility to bring you know, this next generation into this uh, blue bioeconomy or blue economy, sustainable blue economy? And uh, what do you do for that? Thank you, Pierre. You put me on the spot. Um, I'm not from California, can you tell? <laughs> I'm from, I'm actually from Tennessee, but I live in Mississippi, and I'm with the University of Southern Mississippi, which is a R1 institution. Um, last year, we launched uh, the Gulf Blue Cluster, the blue cluster called Gulf Blue, and um, Michael Jones actually was uh, instrumental in the early work that helped us get to that launch period. And then three months ago, we launched our first incubator, uh, Gulf Blue Navigator, which has six cohorts. I'm proud to say that uh, Blue Ocean Gear, which is here today, and Yi with SeaTrack are part of that cohort family. Um, we also had one of your companies move to Mississippi recently. If you don't know, if you haven't missed them, it's Ocean Arrow, and they're having a great time down there on the coast. Uh, don't beat me up in the parking lot. Uh, <clears throat> what are we doing? Uh, what is USM doing on the coast? Because a workforce development for the blue economy is a huge issue, is, is gonna be a huge issue. For, so the first thing that we're doing as a university is we're aligning our programs at Coastal USM. Um, USM is a dual campus university, one in Hattiesburg, one down there in Long Beach, and we're aligning our Long Beach programs to feed students into the blue economy with programs that, academic programs that include ocean engineering, hydrography. In fact, we're one of the top hydrography 
uh, education locations in the world. Um, we're also uh, aligning our free programs. We offer four free modules to people that are interested, adults that are interested in just getting a taste of what a job in the blue economy might be like. Those modules are a module on uncrewed maritime system operation, uh, cyber security, and data management. And so those are free to any adults that are interested. You should move to California. I, I, should, I should move to California. I love California, by the way. <laughs> Um, we also have a Marine Education Center, which uh, exposes K through 12 students, 17,000 of them a year, to uh, potential careers in uh, ocean economy. I, I want to step back for just a second and let you know that this is not our first day at the rodeo. We have a huge shipbuilding industry on the coast of Mississippi, so we've been in the blue economy for a long time. Um, we also have a program called Gen C where we pair high school students with uh, researchers uh, during summer programs so that they work side by side and understand what type of research opportunities, but also what type of careers are available. I'm talking too much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because, no, 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 but I, I think it was very important also to have, you know, your view because you're not from California, but what you're doing is very essential. So um, we've heard about you know, these different experiences, and I'm going to turn to Vanessa as well, because she's training the next you know, uh, entrepreneurs as well. So I think that uh, it's very important you know, to understand also from an international point of view. You were mentioning the trainees of the trainers, uh, the trainers of the trainees. Uh, what's going to be you know, uh, the ideal view if we want to interact at global level to bring more workforce towards USA? And uh, do you have any idea of plan that you're developing for that? Are you, are you asking about international yeah. workforce? Um, I mean, I think I, I was showing you the data and obviously there are a lot of global companies and there are companies that have also US affiliates, but I think this is gonna be an area where if there isn't the workforce here, then we're obviously going to have to have workforce from other areas. Yeah, because most of the wind, offshore wind, is, is very developed in Europe, and they are much more advanced, you know, than the, uh, you know, the California at this right. stage. So, how do you you can attract, you know, these people to come to California and and to help, you know, for the development? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that I'd, I'd be interested to know what the developers and others in the audience think. I mean, I think that is happening, but I think that with offshore wind, I feel like we are all recognizing that the number of workers that are needed globally, because, because while you know, we were citing our statistics, I think it's China built as much offshore wind last year as we're talking about building like in the next you know, 15 years or something. So, so it's not impossible, but we do want to be developing our future workforce. I think one of the things that's a challenge is the jobs are all not right now, right? And how do we have a progression? And how do we possibly put workers into positions that then they can move to something else along, along the way? You go, Eddie. But just adding on to that, yeah. I think the worst thing you can do is train up people for a job that doesn't exist. Right. Like when I talk about that in the community, most people remember even from the 2008, 2009 era where there was a ton of promise around federal training dollars, but the jobs that they wanted, sustainable careers were not at the end of that job training rainbow, if you want to think of it that way. So something to be mindful of. And the one good thing about offshore wind is it does provide those longer term sustainable construction careers, particularly if you're talking about unionized career trades, and then you're starting to see that on the East Coast, hopefully it also translate on the West Coast as well. So, so we're lucky to have, you know, rep high representative from Norway sitting here, watching his telephone. Um, you are a small nation, but a great nation. Uh, you live with the sea, you live by the sea. And I've been always surprised, you know, by the quality of the training, the high level education. So what would be one recommendation you're gonna do to the panel? One recommendation to the panel. Um, 
It's a it's a great question and uh, quite hard to to answer on top of my mind. But I think in you know you also have an offshore energy industry already here in California. You have a big blue economy here in California. So if we talk about offshore wind specifically, there's a parallel to Norway because we are also trying to build our own offshore wind industry and we have to use the expertise, the competence, the people, the knowledge. Uh, the schools, the training, the education, the communities that we already have and transfer that into a new sort of sector or a new part of the blue economy. So trying to uh, utilize what is already there and building on that, that I think that's important. It's, it could probably be easy to think about offshore wind as something completely new, that this is a whole new thing, but uh, uh, it isn't. In many ways, it's not really. It is building on the ex existing uh, expertise and competence that is already there. So then, I recommend that you should be sitting with uh, with our friend, you know, and start, you know, exchanging ideas with Norway because they're very well advanced in that. And um, I've got a question for you. What can what would be the question that you should ask, you know, the audience? You have every type of competencies in the audience. What would be the one question you would like to ask them? Um, well, before I ask the question, let me just say what I am inspired by is that there are spots in California, in Los Angeles, at the Port of Los Angeles, groups like Alta C that are creating certificate programs that are very much like what you described, what's happening, you know, out in Mississippi, where people can get, you know, a community college certificate, I think, to do underwater robotics, or we're very close to that, and to do aquaculture. So those are two places that's small. But you know that's just one 35-acre campus that's starting to develop that. Once we get the model for that going, that's the kind of thing that we have to replicate incredibly quickly. I guess the one question I would ask is sort of, you know, again, we've got an amazing group of, of incredibly smart people who, who are on the cusp of, I think, you know, really being able to, to impact uh, climate in a very positive and sustainable way. What's holding you back from sort of joining together in, in sort of a political force that would allow you to multiply your efforts? Maybe, Matt, you know, you have the answer on this because this is your role. You should be, you know, teaming up everybody, you know, and, uh, and get you to the, to the point. What do you think? Uh, you are in a full nap. Uh, Poetic justice. Um, well, I'm still learning a lot about uh, the, the, the sector and, and what's necessary. And so I was really quite interested in uh, what Nancy said about ports being central points uh, for you know, uh, developing the blue economy. I'm not really sure if I'm going to answer you know, this particular question because I had one that I also wanted to pose. Is because yesterday we also had um, uh, the discussion of the sustainable blue economy and workforce development. And also the, the topic of ports came up. And so I'm wondering if there might be like a, a more of a cohesive strategy, at least on the West Coast, for example, that's where we're located. And we already have a trend towards um, collaboration with the various ports up and down the West Coast. And so if that might not just be about, you know, renewable energy and uh, in the offshore sector and, you know, the West Coast US, but just about workforce development in, in general. And if we could use that as a part of our, our strategy moving forward, because we have to have, you know, with limited resources of TMA Blue Tech, we have to have just a few points of, uh, of strategic focus and uh, workforce development would seem to be one of those things that would be most effective and ports would be one of those easy conduits. So I'm just wondering if you might have any advice about how to proceed at this point. It's again, here, you ask me a question, now I'm like hitting it back, it's like tennis, but I was going to ask that in the first place. It's okay, Peter. Well, partially, but um, you know, this is the recommendation I made this morning. Why don't you bring, you know, the 10 largest investors from California in a room no more than 50 people, with the key main key stakeholders talking about this blue vision. And why don't you try you know, to federate them behind your vision? Because you need money, and if you get you know, the 10 most important investors, talking about Silicon Valley or other ones, they're gonna follow that, because they know that renewable is very important, but uh, they need guidance, and you have you know, the knowledge, you have you know, the wording, and you know how to address this kind of issue. 
So maybe, you know, with the collaboration of Matt, you can set up this high level, you know, stakeholder meeting to engage and make, you know, California, you know, the most advanced blue state uh, in, in the US. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> I see, I see. No, I mean, I, 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 I think that's exactly right, but I wouldn't limit it to California. I, I think that what we can do here is not, and it's, I wouldn't just limit it to the West Coast, but I, I would look down to, you know, down to the Gulf states and see the work that they're doing and be so excited about that. And, and it, the funny thing is about so much of this blue economy stuff is it's not just around states that are next to the ocean, but so much of it happens in the central part of the U.S. And, and as our economy now, you know, I mean, continues to sort of stumble along, if, if you will, this concept of workforce and workers and an economy and building an economy sustainably to meet the goals that the presidents have laid out, I think is a very positive thing that we can organize not only investors, but the public around to be able to really move forward quickly. But we have to ensure that we move forward quickly, not leave so many of the communities that have historically been left behind, not just in the environmental justice communities, but in so much of the deep south where we've just said, oh, well, we don't even know where that is. So, you know, we've <laughs> got to get past that and do smarter organizing. You're right. Yeah, You're coming in. So tell us, you know, who you are and uh, what will be your question. I have many yeah. of other, you know, questions, so I will go around. I'm coming to, to you, Vanessa. Don't worry. I'm, uh, I'm Ed Larson. I'm uh, with the Tampa Deep Sea Explorers. We do underwater vehicles. And uh, I've been listening this morning, and I've been listening to the, the talks, and uh, the problem seems to be a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of politics, right? Politics follows the buzz. It doesn't create the buzz. And... Have you considered pitching an idea to the X Prize? To who? I'm sorry. The to X Prize? Oh, X Prize. No. Oh, yeah. If you want to generate buzz and you want to attract the investors, you've got 20 or 30 companies here, each who would be probably happy to sponsor a team to help develop their technology, advance their technology, promote their technology. And when you launch an X Prize, you get a thousand super motivated people running all around talking to the investors that you're trying to attract. Yeah, well, uh, it reminds me that in 2017, we were in Halifax, and we launched, you know, the, the first X-Prize, you know, dedicated to the ocean. Uh, I haven't been impressed, you know, by the result. I think that we have in the room, you know, the most uh, interesting uh, vision with scripts, and scripts should take, you know, this lead. There should be a scripts prize. Because you, you're the most recognized institution worldwide, and what you're doing, Vanessa, is great. But I think that you need to go one step further, and you have a, a legacy, and you should use you know, the image that Scripps has around the world you know, to take the lead on this. And this is a great idea, by the way. What do you think, Vanessa? <laughs> <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> A uh, loaded question in this group. Um, I mean, I think that's a great idea. It's way above my pay grade to make those types of decisions, but I think this conversation is really great. Yeah. And just kind of to your guys' all point, you know, as an academic institution here, we had a, a panel yesterday on workforce development. Mira Costa is a community college here in San Diego that was talking about certificate courses for, you know, really good jobs and quick turnaround time and getting people uh, up to speed for these blue economy jobs potentially offshore wind, aquaculture, but you know, how do we get the conversation started soon enough so we can build programs and capacity building to feed into yeah. you know, helping staff the workforce um, to the jobs that you guys need? How can we work together with our partners to be able to make sure that we've got the cascade of different types of skill sets that you need? To all of your points, you're gonna need so many different kinds of jobs and skill sets and expertise to build off not just science and research, but you know, building and construction and everything. So how do we have put all those parts together? And then another thought to all the policy, I mean, you know, aquaculture, which was mentioned before, offshore wind, I mean, pretty much everything in the blue economy, any workforce development, any jobs, any opportunities that we need, we're gonna need agreement from federal, state, yep. regional, the ports, you know, permitting is a huge barrier that we're seeing in all the different industries, aquaculture, offshore wind running an accelerator program now, I'm even learning more, you know, we're having like young entrepreneurs that are trying to start startups in aquaculture with seaweed and they can't get permits. It takes multiple years and millions of dollars 
cow wave, you know, it takes a myriad of different permits to get anything done off the pier at Scripps. So how do we all come together to really advance this and have that conversation? I mean, I would love to be a part of that, but again, it's, it's, it's way above my pay grade at Scripps, so I can't make any commitments here, but yeah. I mean, I mean, one thing that I want to say is that I do feel like we are seeing, you know, creative things happening on the East Coast and that I do feel like there's things we can learn for the West from some of the initiatives that different schools are pursuing and the Maritime Academies, et cetera, on the, on the East Coast. But I just think that the, um, you know, the size of what we want to do is definitely going to take a focused effort, but I love the idea of us figuring out how to really mobilize the blue yeah. economy as much as possible. Because I think another thing is that, you know, as you know, there's there's industries in the ocean that feel threatened. And I think many of us believe that there's future opportunities that for us to all work together. So, so now we, we're going to have a question from Ferris. What, what is SMC? Uh, so at Santa Monica College, and we are working with all to see on that aquaculture certificate program. Um, and we also have uh, certificates in solar um, installation, energy efficiency, but we've had a problem because we haven't been able to get the, the companies, the solar companies and energy efficiency companies to look to our students first to hire um, either for internships or for, you know, open positions. And I think that that's really critical that the industry, and it's not just SMC that's had that problem. I've talked to other um, community colleges that have had, you know, similar programs that are struggling because, you know, the, the industry is just running so fast. They're just like, we need to grab anyone off the street, teach them everything that we need them to know. But we're, you know, we're getting jumped over. So that's just a critical point that I just want to make sure that it doesn't get missed. I remember when we were setting up some of the first solar installation classes at the East LA Skills Tech and Training Center, which is not Santa Monica College, but was even further away. And we were trying to create sort of that first class because there wasn't even a single class, you know, th there was just no standardization to what you had to do. Um, but I think one of the things, one of the advantages that we may see on offshore wind in this is that with the bidding credits, that are now gonna be asked for. So if you wanna put in a bid for one of these areas, what, you know, one of the five areas that we have, you get a credit for three different issues. One is, and I'll look to the experts here, if it's um, building a workforce or a supply chain in California, two is, be, and that's the 20% credit, there's a 5% credit if you're working with impacted communities, so think tribal and the fishing groups, and there's another 5% credit if you're working with impacted communities who might just be impacted by this issue. So think environmental justice and sort of other groups there. So it's, and those bidding credits were not an accident. That, that was done with a lot of advocacy um, from somebody right over here on the stage who looks a lot like this guy, but you know, who sort of put that together in the hopes that we don't have that problem, that we don't get leapfrog over, if that's a, an actual word, but you know what I mean? So we can figure a lot of that stuff out, but we've got to do it with smarts, with a little bit of foresight and some coordination. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So we have uh, Kendra McDonald. She is the, the CEO from the uh, Ocean Supercluster Canada. She's very shy. She is very silent, but she, she has, well, she's managing, you know, all the blue vision, you know, for Canada. I'd like, you know, to hear from her and maybe she can give you an advice on that. Uh, that's a very big question. Sorry, what am I giving advice on? Just to uh, make sure. <laughs> she, she and, you know, the idea is, you know, tell us about, you know, your expertise in terms of the blue vision and how you can accelerate and how you, you look into the Right. Um, that's still a really big question. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think, I don't think there's a magic bullet from a Canadian perspective. I think talent development and workforce is, is a huge challenge, and, and I'm on a panel later, so I could talk about it later, but that's all good. I could talk about it now um, and scoop myself. Um, so, you know, we are... 
um, looking at how we steal more, more talent away from other sectors, especially IT more broadly. So, you know, when we look to, so Canada's trying to play catch up uh, in terms of wind. Uh, there was someone that mentioned earlier that Canada's kind of working on getting their act together. Um, they have lots of capability in terms of offshore, offshore oil and gas, um, and some of that translates to aquaculture and some of that will translate to uh, to wind. Uh, Canada also has really strong, where we're trying to target, is we have really strong artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, data science capability, but very little of it. In fact, all of our AI institutes, institutes are in Edmonton, Toronto, and not all of them, but the majority, Edmonton, Toronto, and Montreal, and for the most part, don't do any ocean. So how do we get that capability and interest into um, our ocean economy? So that's a big focus for us, and so we just launched Startup Genome, uh, worked with Startup Genome and did some startup, a startup report and launched it at WebEx in Lisbon which is a technology conference to put blue tech tech into, onto the technology radar screen in a different way. So it's not offshore renewables specifically, but it is what's happening in um, blue economy overall. Yeah, and we can continue later you know, with the other panel. So final words. Uh, it has been an interesting discussion, and thank you all for you know, participating. So we're going to start with you. What are the three main points you want, you know, to, to, to keep, you know, for our audience and, 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 and make sure that we're going to progress on that? What are the three main essential points? Well, um, I think for me, what I have seen with um, our work with the Business Network is um, that it is about bringing people together and the business-to-business -business synergy so I think my main point is I hope some new relationships are going to come out of this conference that we can um, expand on, both all of us and then obviously individuals, and then stay engaged and then just get ready for, um, I, I just think that once the auction happens, um, everyone is going to be laser focused on how do we get from that becomes A to Z, and it's going to take a lot of um, concentrated work, but we should be grateful to uh, both of these gentlemen and many others who got the legislature focused also, the policymakers, on why they needed to lift up um, this issue and bring offshore wind to the West. So. Excellent. Eddie, the takeaway message. It just really one, uh, the idea of local accountability and creating local environments. So you'll hear me use the word local, local, local a lot. But I think at this point, the state is into this technology. There is an ambitious vision for it. But, and then the feds, the federal government is also very much supporting it as we're seeing from everything from you know tax credits to say the bidding credit design of the auction itself. But at the end of the day, it's really you know, incumbent upon the developers to work well with local communities. If they don't, I've been, you know, as a community advocate, I've seen situations where literally the construction gates are blocked by community protests. You do not want that happening on something like this. It shouldn't be happening given the amount of money and resources already dedicated to it. So hopefully, if you have the awareness of you know, the ground circumstances, that'll put you much further ahead in getting this sustainably done. Excellent. So Dan, except you know from the script surprise that we're gonna you're gonna commit to, uh, except from that, what would be the takeaway message? I think let's think big. You know, the, the, maybe the one thing I would think about is that when we started with solar, and I was saying you know we did the million solar roofs, we didn't shy away from going to Governor Schwarzenegger and say you know oh we want a program that'll say. 10,000 solar roofs. I mean, to be honest, we did. And he kicked us out of his office and said, I want a movie star-like project to be able to do. And I think we need to be able to do that same kind of organizing here is what is our million project X, you know, whatever it is, let's think big and let's not shy away from going big on what the, a sustainable blue economy can mean for, like I said, not just California, not just for the West Coast, but for the world. 
But this is, you know, the American dream. And yeah. this is why from Europe, we look at you with a lot of uh, jealousy because we know that you think big and you achieve big. So this is good. I'd like, you know, to thank you all for this very interactive, you know, uh, discussions. And uh, we're going to move to the next one. Thank you and join me, you know, to thank the panelists. <laughs>